All right, thanks for coming back, you guys. I appreciate it. Um, today, I really wanna cover IV vasoactive medications so you know how to handle this. Generally, when we talk about this, we're talking about pressors. People say pressors, but we're also gonna talk about some medications that we consider inotropes, meaning they make your heart squeeze better as opposed to just pressing down your blood vessels. So I like referring to them as vasoactive medications, okay? First thing I wanna say, we have a patient in shock. The first thing we wanna try, unless we know the patient has cardiogenic shock, the first thing we're gonna do is fluids. So what I'm talking about here, all these things that are gonna happen are gonna happen generally after we do fluids. Okay, so that's where it's step one. After we do fluids and we don't get their mean arterial blood pressure to 65, then we talk about putting patients on these various medications, okay? So always think about MAP greater than 65 is really gonna be your goal for most diagnoses, okay? Is that cool? All right, um, so really what I wanna do is go through the different medications, what receptors they affect, and when we wanna use them, okay? So there's three big kind of receptors um, that we think about these affecting. One is called the alpha-1 receptor. You guys know what alpha-1 receptors do? Yeah, so they squeeze blood vessels. So I think of that as increasing blood pressure. Okay, then we have beta-1. What do beta-1 do? Yeah, so this is inotropy, so making sure your heart squeezes better, and chronotropy, making your heart go faster. And then there's beta-2, what does that do? It actually does vasodilation too. So this one can actually make your blood, blood pressure go down. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this. There are some different uh, medications that affect some other receptors, and we'll talk a little bit about them when we hit those specific ones. But these are sort of the key places to start. All right, the first medication I wanna start with is phenylephrine. Phenylephrine has mainly, like all, alpha-1 activity. This is gonna squeeze your vessels, but it's not gonna do a lot of good as far as making your heart beat faster or harder, okay? So if you already have a heart problem, this can be sort of a dangerous medicine to use because now your heart has to work even harder to overcome the squeezing of your blood vessels, okay? So keep that in mind, all right? The next one we're gonna talk about is norepinephrine. So this has a lot of alpha, but also now we're bringing in the beta. So you're getting some squeeze out of this too, okay? And then we talk about epinephrine. And we sort of are shifting across the screen as we do this. So now we still have alpha, but we also have a bunch of beta happening here, okay? So this is strongly alpha and strongly beta. And then we have dobutamine. So this is the first one that we're gonna think of. These all we think of as vasopressors. Dobutamine we think of as an inotrope. Really what this is gonna do is make that heart squeeze faster and better. So really that's gonna be way more over here. Okay. All right, <coughs> two other ones that are important for you to know. So the first one is vasopressin. Vasopressin is its own deal. It acts on a vasopressin receptor, okay? And then the other one that we talk about is dopamine. I'm not gonna talk about dopamine a lot because the, the thing about dopamine is it causes more heart arrhythmias without really having any benefit over some of the other agents, okay? So that's all we're gonna say about dopamine for today is don't worry about it so much, okay? Any questions about that so far? Yeah. What about milrinone? Oh, that's a great question. So milrinone works by a different mechanism. It's a phosphodiesterase, <coughs> but it does it exactly the same effect on the end organs as dopamine, so I, or dopamine, excuse me. So I generally think of them together. Okay, cool. All right, so now I wanna go through and talk about when we're gonna use these different medications and I'm trying to leave a bunch of space for my norepinephrine because that's really going to be our go-to in most cases. All right, so epinephrine, dobutamine, and vasopressin. 
Okay, so phenylephrine. The main times we use phenylephrine is we use it when we just need some more squeeze in our blood vessels. So a time when we might wanna reach for that might be neurogenic shock. A good time to use that is when we have someone who's in septic shock, but their heart rate's already going really fast, so we don't want their heart rate to go even faster. So someone with septic shock and AFib with RVR, it would be a good choice for them, okay? But it's not really first line, first line for anything, okay? We generally think of it as being nice to use because people are more comfortable using it through a peripheral IV. But as we'll talk about, we can also use some of these other ones through a peripheral IV temporarily while we get ourselves going too, okay? But some things to think about, it can be good for neurogenic shock, and it can be good for septic and AFib with RVR. All right, norepinephrine. So norepinephrine is like first line, first line. So it's first line for sepsis, for septic shock. It's gonna be first line really for neurogenic. And then I think of it as first line for cardiogenic if my blood pressure is really low, okay? And we'll talk about why that is in just a second, okay? With me so far? Okay, so that's our key times for norepinephrine. Again, you're not really ever gonna be wrong going with norepinephrine as your first drug, except for in one case, which is the first one we'll talk about with epinephrine, which is anaphylactic shock. So this is absolutely first line for anaphylactic shock and then also for code situations. It's really gonna be first line. This is now second line for sepsis, for septic shock. I'll talk more about what that means and how that comes into the picture in a second, okay? So dobutamine, when would we use dobutamine? Cardiogenic shock. Yeah, perfect. So cardiogenic shock, it's gonna be first line, but the trick of it is that we talked about how these beta receptors can actually make your blood pressure go down, right? So if we already have someone who's in cardiogenic shock with low blood pressure, we have to make sure we get that up first because the dobutamine will make the blood pressure go lower first before that cardiac output really starts kicking in, okay? So this is gonna be first line for cardiogenic if we have adequate blood pressure. Yeah. Well, you have people on two, like norepinephrine and dobutamine? Yeah, great question. Um, so for our cardiogenic shock specifically, you're asking, yes. So you can have someone on that norepinephrine, get their blood pressure to a safe place, then try to get that dobutamine started, and then try to get the norepi off as you get that dobutamine kicking in. Okay, great question. All right, vasopressin. Vasopressin is gonna be second line septic shock and like I said we're not going to really talk about dopamine. All right so when I say that norepinephrine is first line and epinephrine and vasopressin are second line this is how I manage this situation. If I have someone who is in septic shock and I start them on norepinephrine so generally when I start someone on norepinephrine I start them at 10 micrograms per minute. And the reason I do that is I want that medicine to start getting through that IV tubing and get into my patient. And then we generally think of the dose of this being anywhere from really like five to 30 micrograms per minute. Okay, so I get it into their body. I try to take it down to five if I can. I titrate it higher if I have to. If I get to the point where I'm on 15 micrograms per minute of norepinephrine, then I go ahead and tack on nor uh, vasopressin. Yeah. If someone doesn't yet have a central line and they only have the peripheral line, is there a max dose of norepinephrine that they can have going through the peripheral line? So how I want you to keep thinking about this is 
you can use that peripheral line as long as you have to. If you have to give someone pressors to a peripheral line to keep them alive till you get them to a safe place where they can safely get a line, do that. You want to get a central line for these people as fast as possible, but if you have to give it to the peripheral line, that's okay. I don't want you to not use it because you're afraid of some limit. Give it to keep them alive, get your central line as soon as you can. Okay, cool. All right, so again, we get this up to 15, we add on our vasopressin. So vasopressin dosing is different than all the other medications. So vasopressin, we think of the, the dose as being 0.03 units per minute. And we don't titrate that. I sort of think of vasopressin as hormone replacement. So we just stick it on. If we get to needing 15 of, nor of uh, norepinephrine, we stick that on and we sort of let it hang out and then we can stop it later as we need to. Okay? But we don't really titrate up and down like we sort of constantly titrate up and down a lot of the others. All right, cool. So the other option that some other folks will do is that once they're at that 15 of norepinephrine, they may tack on the epinephrine. That is a reasonable plan as well. Okay? And in general, when we're talking about septic shock dosing, the dose for this is also gonna be sort of that five to 30 micrograms per minute. Again, there's not really that, that 30 is an arbitrary limit because if you need more than that to keep someone alive, you need more than that to keep someone alive, okay? And then as far as septic shock is concerned, we said that this is first line, these two are second line. Phenylephrine, they say now is for special situations. And like we talked about, the special situation would be someone who has septic shock, but their heart rate's already going super fast, okay? All right. And then we think about putting the dobutamine on if someone gets septic shock and then starts getting some cardiac dysfunction from that, then we put this on to increase that squeeze. Okay. This may be really key in our patients with coronavirus because our patients with coronavirus are often getting septic shock first and then developing a cardiogenic shock after. That's why I really wanna make sure we talked about all vasoactive meds instead of just pressors, okay? Um, so a couple other key points I want you guys to take from this. So phenylephrine dosing is usually I think of it as about zero to 200 micrograms per minute, sort of the dose there, um, pretty wide range of what you can use, but we don't really use it that much anymore. Uh, and then dobutamine, we generally think of this dosing as being somewhere from five to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. The D drugs tend to be microgram per kilogram per minute, whereas the other ones tend to be microgram per minute. Sort of easy way to remember that offhand. Yeah. Just to remember again, we're titrating these for a map greater than 65. Yep. How do how are we measuring that? Is it yeah, how are we? Such measuring? a good question. Okay, so a lot of places you can't set up an A-line and have that ready to go with all the monitoring you need to make that happen. Um, and the tubing and whatnot. So while again, you're getting these medications going, it's okay to use just your blood pressure cuff as your indicator for blood pressure until you get your patient to an intensive care unit where they can get that A-line in, get that monitoring going, okay? So don't not use them because you can't get an A-line. Get them started, save the life, then get the A-line. Yeah. Is there anything else I should be looking at besides the blood pressure? Mm, that's a great question. So the other thing that we want to watch regularly is lactate. So we watch lactate because lactate's an indication of how well your body's perfusing. And that's the whole goal of this, is to make sure we're perfusing our organs. Okay. So you can do your lactate about every four hours uh, and see how you're trending lactate. Hopefully that's clearing as you're managing the patient. What is your cutoff to say that something is not well perfusing for your lactate? Ah, that's a great question. So really we use two is like our normal level. So we really say at four, someone's in shock. Uh, two is really where we wanna get people below. Cool? All right, so one more thing I wanna make a point of for you is epinephrine. There's a lot of confusion about how to dose epinephrine. And we talked about this is the dose if we have someone on an epinephrine drip for septic shock. That's not the same as what we would give in these other two situations, okay? Which you have here, right? So for a code situation, we always go into the code cart 
and we find our little auto injector, Bristol jet, whatever you want to call it. And what does that have in it? Anyone know? So that has one milligram. That has one milligram of IV epinephrine in it. Okay, so we give that whole thing, if some, we're doing ACLS on someone who has coded, we give a milligram of epinephrine. Okay. Does anyone know what we give for anaphylactic shock? Higher doses? Okay, so it's actually a lower dose, oh. and we're gonna give it differently. So if you think about an EpiPen, that people take with them. So the dose there, so I'm gonna put here, EpiPen is 0.3 milligrams IM, okay? So less, and it's going IM, not IV. Okay, so that's a big point for you guys to remember. We don't wanna just be pushing this in someone who has anaphylactic shock. We wanna be giving them EpiPen dosing. If by chance you can't, because you don't have any more EpiPens, then your plan is gonna be put them on a drip if you need to, or if you have to give them an IV dose, it's actually 50 micrograms is the dose of that, which is you know, a teeny tiny fraction of that one milligram, okay? So key things that um, I want you to take from all of this is you can give them through a peripheral IV if you need to. Norepi is a great place to start for almost all problems. But in this specific problem of coronavirus, consider that you're gonna to have to treat that septic shock first and then probably come back and do some treatment for that cardiogenic shock, okay? And then get your A-line as soon as you can to really closely, every second, monitor that blood pressure instead of having that blood pressure cuff going really, really frequently. Okay, yeah, and then just also get your central line as soon as you can. Any other questions you guys have about that? Okay, go forth and conquer. Thanks, guys.